This week we're learning the Sikha of Shabbos Parshas Vayigash Tavshin and Beis. The Sikha can be found in Sefer HaSikha's Tavshin and Beis, Chelek Aleph, page 214. The Rebbe starts in Sefer Aleph, saying that we spoke many, many times already that all matters that are discussed in Torah, now Torah we know is in the word of Hayra, means a lesson, always contain inside of themselves everlasting and eternal Hayrois for each and every Yid. And for Klal Yisrael in all places, in all times, and in every situation. General Heroes, and also Heroes that are specifically connected with the current times and events of what's going on in a certain time and place of where the Yid is. This is, of course, also true regarding the Parshas Hashavua within Torah, with which we always have to live with the times, as Da'at Rebbe tells us, Lebem Midetzayt. So this week's parsha, Vayigash Eil of Yehuda, so surely there's an everlasting Hayra lesson which clarifies and explains to us the whole idea of how our Avoida has to be, how the conduct of a Yid has to be, also in accordance to the current and present time, the very, very last moments of Golos, so close to the Geulah HaMitiz Vashleima, as we spoke many times and specifically recently. Now, at first glance, the connection between the parish of Ayigash Eil of Yehuda and the Geula is mainly seen in the Haftoira of the Shabbos, which we know that the Haftoira is always in some way related and similar to the parsha. What does it speak about in the Haftoira? In the Haftoira, it discusses the, the Ichud, the unity between Malchus Yehuda and Malchus Yosef, the way it's going to be when Mashiach comes. The Pasuk says that the Abisha tells the Navi he should take one piece of wood and write on it the word Li Yehuda, that this is for the Shvatim that are with Yehuda. Take another piece of wood and write on it that this is for Yosef, for the rest of the Eden that are along with Yosef. Bring the two pieces of wood together. They will turn into one piece of wood. And this represents, says Hashem, that I'm going to take the Eden from amongst the nations where they were scattered. I'm going to collect them, I'm going to gather them, and I will make them all into one big nation, all the Shemotim, unite once again. There will be one king over all the Yidden, not like in the time when the Yidden were divided. David Avdi, Nasi Lohem Lo'olam, David HaMelech, or descendant from David HaMelech, Mashiach, of course, will be the Nasi over all Yidden forever. And finally, all the Goyim will know that I am Hashem. So seemingly the connection between the Parsha and the Geula is mainly seen in the Haftorah. However, in addition to the fact that the Haftorah only shows that there's a connection to the Geula, still doesn't tell us yet what the Hayra, the practical lesson for us in Avoida of Bnei Yisroel is standing the moments before the Geula. In addition to that, we want to understand also what is the connection between the Haftorah and the actual Parsha. In fact, it would seem just the opposite. In Vayigash Eil of Yehuda, that's in the Parsha, seems to be, as we'll see in a minute, actually exactly the opposite of what the Haftoira tells us, that David Avdi Nasi Lahem Loilom, which is in the Haftoira. Why is that? Because in Vayigash Eil of Yehuda, Yehuda approaching Yosef, and generally in the Parsha, what seems to be mainly emphasized is how Yosef is boss, how Yosef is in command in the land of Mitzrayim. And Yehuda needs to come on to Yosef. He needs to approach Yosef by Yigash Elov. He needs to beg and request that Binyamin should be freed. And as the Pasuk says, Vayoymer bi adoini. Yehuda is speaking to Yosef saying, please my master. So clearly Yosef is the master over here. Yedaber no avducha. Please let your servant speak. So Yehuda is the servant. Ki chamoicha kefaroi. He says, you're just like Paroi, which, as the Mepharshim explained, means, I consider you, you are as important as the king. Because Paroi appointed him over the whole land of Mitzrayim, saying that without you, no one could raise a hand or a foot in the land of Mitzrayim. Especially taking into consideration that Paroi is the superpower at the time. So this all seems to be saying that Yosef is so powerful and Yehuda is subservient to him. Whereas La'asid Lavoi, which that's what the Haftoira is speaking about, there it comes out how Yehuda is the one that's higher and greater than everyone, including Yosef. There will be one king over all Yidin. And who is that king? The Avdi David. 
From Shevet Yehuda will be the Melech over all Yidin, and the David Avdi Nasi Lahem Loilum. So, if anything, it seems to be that the Parsha and the Aftoid are actually bringing out two opposites. In order to explain this as the Rebbe and Siv Gimel, we're first going to have a look at the connection between the beginning of the Parsha with the end of the Parsha. As discussed many, many times, based on a clown, note Soifon Betchilason, Betchilason Besoifon, that the beginning is wedged. In the end, the end and the beginning, that the beginning and the end have a very, very strong connection to each other. The same must be true also regarding the Parsha. So here, too, we could ask a similar question. In the end of the Parsha, the very, very end of the Parsha, the Pasuk says, Vayeshev Yisrael, the Yidin were living in the land of Mitzrayim, in the land of Goshen. They took hold of the land, they were multiplying, being fruitful and multiplying in the land, which seems to be showing the strength of Yaakov and his children. That even while being in the land of Mitzrayim, under the rulership of Pari Melech Mitzrayim, yet Paroi gives them and tells them that Tuv Kol Eretz Mitzrayim Lochemu, they can take the best of the land. It's according to his orders, they get a holding in the land, and the very, very best. And as we just said, they take hold of the land and they multiply in it, etc., very much. So it seems to be speaking again about the strength of Yidin in the land of Mitzrayim and so on. Contrast that with the beginning of Parsha by Yigashel of Yehuda, which seems to be showing that Yehuda and his brothers are in a very lowly situation where they need to be begging and pleading with Yosef, who is the boss over the whole land of Mitzrayim, obviously before the time that he let himself be known to his brothers who he really is. So this seems to be a situation where the Yidin are under and lower than the ruler the person in charge of Mitzrayim, which seems to be the opposite of the end of the parsha, which is bringing, uh, bringing out and, and, and highlighting the strength of Bnei Yisrael. So the Rebbe says in Siv Dalud, we can explain it in the following way. Even though that it's true that at first glance it seems to be, that when Yehuda approaches Yosef, it seems more to be highlighting the strength of Yosef as the leader of Mitzrayim, and how Yehuda needs to come on to him, but really, if we think about it a little bit deeper, we'll see that Yehuda is acting over here in a very, very strong and bold way, completely out of the ordinary. Yosef, if we think about it, as a representative of Pari, is the one ruling the whole land. Bilodecha, without your permission, no one can lift a hand or a foot in the land of Mitzrayim. Especially, as we mentioned before, that Pari is the superpower at the time. And Yosef being being equal to Pari, as Yehuda himself said, obviously has this tremendous amount of, of power. Despite all of this, what does Yehuda do? Obviously, without realizing that this person he's speaking to is his brother Yosef, he is completely not affected by all of this. He acts in a way that's completely courageous, even without asking any sort of permission from Yosef in advance. He approaches Yosef in a strong way, and he speaks cautious, he speaks harshly to Yosef. And that's why he actually has to say, al don't get angry. Even though he knows he's putting himself in danger over here, he's putting himself, his life in danger, knowing what Yosef might do to him because of his chutzpah, and yet this is the way he acts. So in other words, really what we see in Vayigash El of Yehuda is the amazing power and strength and courage of Yehuda. Now we can understand the connection between Vayiga Sheil of Yehuda, the beginning of the parsha, and the end of the parsha, where Yidin are strong in the land of Mitzrayim. They're living over there in the best part of Mitzrayim, settling over there, multiplying over there. And also the connection between Yehuda becoming leader in the Haftoira, the David of the Nasilahem Loilom, bringing out the strength of the Milo of Yehuda, because this is really similar and coming as a result of the strength of Ayiga Shail of Yehuda in the beginning of the parsha, where Yehuda is taking the stand and coming out with his full courage. Says the Rebbe, the Eshloima, we could say that the actual strength of Ayiga Shail of Yehuda, this is what gives the Yaakov and his children the Koyach later to go down into Mitzrayim, and in a way where they're not under the rulership of Mitzrayim, but on the contrary, they take hold of Mitzrayim, they multiply in Mitzrayim. And furthermore, as we just said, this ultimately leads to the David Avdi Nasi Lohem Lo'ilom, when the true leader of Bnei Yisrael, Moshiach, is going to be coming from David and from Sheba Judah. However, in Sif Hay, the Rebbe says we still need further clarification. 
all of the strength that we spoke about, of Yehuda, is all, all according to Yehuda's thoughts and his premise and thinking that Yosef is a Mishnah Lamelech. He's the second in command of the Goyim. In other words, before Yosef actually lets himself be known to his brothers. So this is all while thinking Yosef is not who he really is. And even though it's true that for the strength and courage of Yehuda, it doesn't really make a difference of who this person is, because he didn't know that it's Yosef. But the fact of the matter is, once we know that it is Yosef, so the truth is that L'cha'ira, we didn't need all of that strength of Yehuda anymore in order to achieve the Vayayach Azubo and the end of the parsha. In other words, why are we saying that specifically because of the strength of Yehuda? It is, this is what led by the end of the parsha the Yidin can be so strong in Mitzrayim, when in truth, we know that it was all just a show, because Yosef ultimately would have revealed himself, and we wouldn't need necessarily the strength of Yehuda. Adar Abed Rebbe says, on the contrary, simply, this Vayayachaz, the fact that they were able to be so strong in Mitzrayim, was actually through Yosef. As the Pesach says, Yosef said, Hashem sent me over here to be able to secure you a place and to save you and to rescue you and so on and so forth. It was in the Schus of Yosef that Pari said that all the good of Mitzrayim is for you. And he was the one that ordered because of Yosef to give him a place in the best part of the land in a way of So why are we saying it's specifically because of Yehuda's courage and strength? In a similar way, we could also ask about the Haftar. Since the strength of Yehuda was only during that time, before he knew that it's Yosef, why are we assuming or why are we saying that this has a connection to the strength of Yehuda and the Haftar? When there will be the leader from Yehuda forever and ever. In other words, what's the connection between that temporary little show of strength? of Yehuda, before he even knows that it's Yosef, to the ultimate strength of Yehuda as being a leader. And again, on the contrary, Adar since Yosef HaTzadik is in truth the boss in Mitzrayim as was eventually revealed. So Lucha Oira, it seems to be opposite of the Haftar, in which we're speaking about Yehuda actually taking charge and coming out ahead of Yosef and V'dovid Avdi Nasi Lohem In other words, the question is as follows. The Rebbe puts it in, a different, in different words a little bit. According to Amitis, according to the way things are really, that Yosef HaTzadik is in truth the ruler of Mitzrayim. So who is the one that expresses the strength of Yidna Mitzrayim? It would seem to be that Yosef is the one that really brings out the ultimate strength of a Yidna Mitzrayim. L'choyra, we don't need the strength of Ayik HaShel of Yehuda to bring this out. If that's the case, why are we saying, or why are we highlighting specifically that it's Yehuda's strength that ultimately leads to all of these other things. However, the Rebbe says, since all of in, all in Yadim of Torah are emes and are eternal, even when there's a kosal kadaitach in Torah, in other words, even when Torah is suggesting something or things look like in a cer- certain way, especially in our case, that Yehuda not only assumed that this was not Yosef, that this was some Goyish leader, but he actually went ahead and acted according to that Bapoyal Mamash. So surely this act of Yehuda, the strength of Yehuda, we must say is not just a little temporary thing while he doesn't know that it's Yosef. But in fact, it achieves something. And in fact, it achieves even the Chidush, even something greater, even than Yosef's strength of that time. And it was Davke in that Koyach because of Yehuda's show of strength. The Yidin were able to eventually to take a hold in the land of Mitzrayim. And ultimately also leading to the David Avdi Nasi Lohem Lo'elo. So in other words, in brief, what the Rebbe is saying so far is that yes, it's true that Yosef is a very, very strong person in Mitzrayim, and even what we know at the end of the story that it's really Yosef. And still, because of Yehuda's show of strength, this brought out even a greater Chiddush, as the Rebbe will elaborate more, more in the Sikha later on, that it's Davka, this strength of Yehuda that has something very, very unique about it, and what it achieves. The Rebbe says this power of Yehuda could also be understood from another point. We know the story that Yaakov Avinu sends Yehuda, as Yehuda Shalach Lafon of Lahoyri is Lafon of Goishna, that Yaakov Avinu sends Yehuda 
to organize a place to figure out what's the, how to settle in the land and so on and so forth. And here again, we could ask a very simple question. Since Yosef is the one that's running Mitzrayim, according to the orders of Paro, Yosef is the one giving Yaakov and his family mate of is the best of the land. Why do we even need Yehuda to organize a place and to figure out what's the best way to settle in it? Why can't Yosef do all of that? So obviously this shows us again that it's somehow specifically the strength of Yehuda that has the ability to, to achieve all of this. In order to explain all of this, what strength of Yehuda are we talking about? And how is that even in a certain way even greater than Yosef's? The Rebbe says we could explain it in the following way. The general strength of a Yid in Oil in this world and in the time of Golos, which we know that all Golias are associated and related to Mitzrayim, all Malchis are called on the name of Mitzrayim. So the strength of the Yid could be expressed in two different ways, or could be seen in two different ways. Option number one is that his strength is only according to that which is possible, according to the laws of nature, according to the rules of nature, according to the way the world runs. In other words, he is limited by nature and by the conduct of the world. And within in Golos, of course, that would mean also that he's limited according to the inyanim of Golos, the laws of the country, etc., etc. Then there's another way, which is that the Yid stands completely higher and above all matters of the world, all matters of Goyim, especially all matters of Golos. And Adarab, the Yid, acts with all of these things with such might and such strength that he has the ability to change the laws of the country to have an impact all around him. And the Rebbe says, this is what Yehuda achieved. That not only is he sort of able to deal with the goals according to the laws of the world of goal and goals, which is sort of what Yosef did, that he was able to settle in the land and work with the land, but still in some way according to the laws of the country. But Yehuda was able to go completely, completely above that as we will see later on in the Sikha, Sivav. To understand this, we're going to have a look at the story of Mordechai HaYehudi in the time of Achashverosh, which in many ways is similar to the story of Yehuda standing before Yosef. Yidin at the time are in Galus Parasumodai, which is under the rulership of King Achashverosh, as the Gemara puts it, Avde Achashverosh Anan, where servants, slaves are in Galus of Achashverosh. Not like in the story of Hanukkah, which was during the time of the Beis Hamikdash. So this was during the time of Golos. And yet, how does Mordechai act in a way of lo yichra v'lo He doesn't kneel, he doesn't bow down. Even though all the other servants of the king, koyrum mishtachavim al-Oman, are bowing down to Oman, ki chen tziva ha-melech, because this is what the king ordered. Yet Mordechai is standing in such a strong way, even when all the servants are saying to him, Madua to over its mitzvahs hamelech. Why are you going against the rules of the king? And yet he's not mispoiled. He does his thing. And the Rebbe brings a very interesting pasuk and a medrash on this regarding to the feast of Achashverosh. It says in the Megillah, "Chen Yisad Hamelech." This is the way the king had established. La siskert soinish vaish that everybody's wishes should be fulfilled by the meal. And the Gemara says, what does it mean, that the meal should be run and should be able to be done according to the wish of Mordechai and Haman. Ish ve'ish refers to Mordechai and Haman. The Gemara brings Psukim. For Mordechai, there's a Pasek Ish Yehudi. On Haman, there's a Pasek Ish Tsar Oyev. So both of them are called by the name Ish. And when the Megillah says that Ahasuerus said it should all be done according to Ritzoin, Ish ve'ish, it means according to the Ritzoin, to the desires of both Mordechai and Haman. That's the Gemara. What does the Medrash say? So the Medrash has two statements. The, f- the first statement is, each one looking at it slightly different. The first statement is, the Abishta said, Tachashverish. I, so to speak, cannot be Yoytze for all of my creations. I cannot, so to speak, do what everyone wishes. As the Medrash will elaborate in a moment. And you think you could be Yoitza and Duker Tsoinish you think you could satisfy everyone? It is customary in the world if two people want to marry the same woman. 
Could they each marry this? Could they both marry the same woman? Either she, either she marries this one or she marries that one. In a similar way, you have two ships. They're both leaving the port. One wants a ruach tzfoinis. One wants a northerly wind. Another one wants a ruach droimis. The other one wants a, 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 a wind from the south. So could there be one wind that will satisfy both? Again, I, either I'll have to give a wind for one or another. So this is what the Eibishter is saying to, to Ahasuerus. You think you could satisfy everyone. And the Medrash continues saying, tomorrow there are two people going to come in front of you. One is an Ish Yehudi and one is an Ish Tzar If One is Mordechai, one is Haman. You think you could be Yotzeh for both of them? You'll have to end up lifting up one and hanging the other. In other words, according to this Pirush in the Medrash, Ahasuerus is making a tremendous mistake. There's no way he could accomplish both things at once. The Ratzin of Mordechai and the Ratzin of Haman. And therefore, the Pasuk is saying to him, there's no way you can be Yitzhak both for Mordechai and Haman. They're complete opposites. That's the first statement in the Medrash. Comes along Rav Huna in the name of Rabbi Yomu ben Levi, and he says slightly different. He says, nowadays, it's true, that when the Ruach Tzfoinis, when the wind from the north is blowing, you can't have the wind from the south blowing. But La'asid Lavoy, when Moshiach is going to come, when the Abishah is going to gather the exiles, the Abishah says, I'm going to bring a, very, bring a very, very strong wind. A wind, a wind that will be able to come from both sides. And the Medrash goes on to say, there's a Pasek Ritzoyin Yirei of Yasa. That the Abishta is the one that could fulfill the wish of all of those that fear him. That means to say that even if there's two wishes that seem to be contrary to each other, and yet the Abishta could fulfill both of them. And that's the Pshat Ritzoyin Yirei of Yasa, that's Shavos and Yishma. The Abishta could fulfill the wish of all of those that fear him. Even though they're opposite to each other, the Abishta could listen and fulfill. Now, this is La Asid Lovey and the way the Abishta deals with those that fear him. Whereas, of course, Achashverosh, again, the point is really the same anyways, there's no way you are going to be able to fulfill your two best friends, but they have, they're so opposite to each other, nevertheless, you wouldn't be able to fulfill it. And even though, again, we had a muscle before that if a person wants to, two people want to marry the same woman, they can't, but again, that's only Boilam Azen, the natural way of the world, but Biyire Hashem, and those that fear Hashem, the Abishta could manage to satisfy everyone. So Asid Lovey, that's the Pshat that the Abishta is going to give Ritzoin Ishvish. Now, this is the way the Medrash says it. But let's go back to the Gemara for a moment. From the Gemara, it seems, when Achashveri said, Lasa is Kirtzoin Ishva Ish, that there's going to be, in the feast, is going to be like the Ratzin of Mordechai and Haman. From the Gemara, it seems like there was no problem with that. This is what Achashverosh did. Even Achashverosh is able to do this. Question is, how does this fit with the Medrash, which the Medrash seems to be saying in both of the Pirushim, that it's really impossible to do this, at least not in this world, to have two opposite desires fulfilled. Even according to the second Pirush of the Medrash, it's only La'asid Lave, the Abishta could do it, and so on. But definitely nowadays, and definitely... Within a human ability, this is completely impossible. So, how does the Gemara seem to be saying that Las is Kurtzoin Ishvaish is something that actually happened? So, the Rebbe says like this in Siv Zayin, we can explain it in the following way. When we say Benoyheik Shaboilam, what is customary in this world according to the na nature, and even by the Abishta Kavayochal, as the Abishta clothes himself within the conduct of the world, which is known as Shei Meloikim, the way the Abishta comes down having a Shaykhaz to the world. In that situation, Taka, there can't be two opposites, Las is Kurtzoy and Ish, Mordechai and Haman, because they're two opposites. When we're speaking about the way the Abishta is completely higher than the conduct of the world, as will be Nizgalo Lo'asid Lavoy, then we could have Las is Kurtzoy and Ish, we could have two opposites coming together. The Rebbe says this is the difference between the various different Pirushim and the Gemara and the Medrash regarding this. In the first Pirush of the Medrash, the Medrash was speaking about how it's customary in this world, the Teva we said it's impossible, these things don't happen. The second Pirush of the Medrash, we said, 
was how the Eibishter is going to conduct himself that there is some room for that the Eibishter could make it happen as two opposite two people want opposite things. Now, what does the Gemara say? We just said that the Gemara seems to be saying that La Seskertsoinish could even happen these days by Achashverish. What's the Pshat of that? The Pshat of that is where the Rebbe is learning the Gemara is telling the message is that really a Yid, even Bizman HaGolos, through his connection to the Abishter, could lift himself up to a situation, to the state of La'asid Lavoy. And therefore, even nowadays, have this idea of Las Yisker Tzoyin Yishvo'ish, as we'll explain in just a moment. So the Rebbe explains in Siv Ches, the explanation of all of this B'Pnimi Yisoyin Yonim works as follows. Ach HaShveyosh, we know that every single thing in this world has a Shoyrish in Kedusha, so Ach HaShveyosh, it's explained in many Sfarim, many places in Chesidus, refers to the Eivish Tekavayochel, as the Chazal tell us, Achashverosh refers to Hakadosh Baruch Hu, called Achashverosh, because Acharis veRashis Shaloi, meaning to say, beginning and end are His. He is the one that's all the way from the beginning and past the end, and so on and so forth. So Achashverosh is a remiss to the Eibushter. When the pasuk says, "Kain Yisad Amelech La Sois Kertzoy Nishvish," the Eibushter established La Sois Kertzoy Nishvish. What does this mean? So the Rebbe says the pshat of here is where the Eibushter set up the teva of the world is that there's a Ritzoyin Ishvish, there's different desires in the world. A person could choose either to act like Mordechai, or to act like Ham, like the Ritzoyin of Mordechai, or it's Ritzoyin of Ham, or Ritzoyin Ishvish. As the famous Rambam, that every person is granted the permission to which way he wants to lean, which way he wants to go. Does he want to go to the good way and be a Tzaddik? He's able to do that. If he wants to go the other way and be a Russia, that's also possible. But that's only the Metzius of Ritzoy Nishvish. In other words, that's only that there could be two opposite desires and a person has to choose one of the ways. But it's one way that he has to choose. But Lasa is Ritzoy Nishvish to be Yoitza, both ways, to be able to have both ways, that's Taka impossible. Because the Ratzin of Mordechai, the will of Mordechai is in matters of Kedusha. The Ratzin of Haman is exactly the opposite. And therefore, it's impossible that you could have both of these desires to ful- be fulfilled, Bishas Maisa, at one time in Poyal Mamish, in practicality. Either it's going to be Ritzayim Mordechai, either Mordechai is going to have his way, either it's going to be the way of Kedusha, or, the, or it's going to be the other way, the way of Haman. To explain it a little bit deeper, the contradiction between La Seisker Tzoyin Ishvo Ish is not only because practically you can't have these two opposites happening at the same time, but really the attitude of Mordechai, the attitude of Hamon, are two completely, completely perspectives, opposite perspectives, two completely opposite approaches, which each one seems to be negating the other one completely. How is that? The desire and the attitude of Mordechai, as we said before, is lo yichra lo yishtachva. He completely does not bow down. As the Chazal say, why is he called Mordechai Hayyehudi? Because he completely denies and denounces Avoy the Zorah. Some of the denies Avoy the Zorah is called a Yehudi. And that's why every Yid is called a Yehudi. Because Yiddishkeit and Yehudi is expressed in this idea that he denies Avoy the Zorah, as we said, lo yichra lo yishtachva. He doesn't bow down. Now what does Avoy the Zorah mean? Avoy the Zara doesn't only mean literally Avoy the Zara idol worship, but really anything that's not connected to serving the Eimishter, even if it's not directly opposite of Shulchan Aruch, but anything that's not directly connected in serving the Eimishter is in a subtle way some sense of Avoy the Zara. What does Avoy the Zara mean? It's an Avoy that is foreign to the Yid. It's not the Indian of the Yid. Because what is the whole idea of a Yid is all la soyser et soyna vicho shema shamaim, a Yid's Avoy is just to do what the Eimishter wants. As the Chazal tell us, the only reason I was created is to serve the Eibishter. And since I'm being created every single second in this world, it's understood that every detail of my life needs to be to serve the Eibishter. And as the Torah actually tells us, that every one of our deeds need to be for the sake of Hashem. In everything that we do, we need to know Hashem. And we say, kol, 
And that means to say, first of all, all of your actions, but not only that, the kol ma'asecha means also every part of the action, every detail of it needs to be l'shem shemayim, because if there's any little detail outside of this, outside of serving Hashem, then that's already considered avoidah zara, avoidah shezara loy, it's something foreign to what the person is created for. And obviously the ultimate is not only kol ma'asecha, l'shem shemayim, which is, which is saying that there is something and it's only for a means to an end, to serve the Eivish there, but really, which means to say that within what you're doing itself, you get to know the Eivish there, and furthermore, it becomes Shemayim itself, not only the Shem Shemayim, this itself is becoming holy, and the Rebbe gives an example with food and drink, so sometimes we're eating and drinking in order to serve the Eivish there later, but there is a higher level, of course, of eating and drinking, for example, on Shabbos, when that itself becomes part of a mitzvah, the mitzvah of Oynik Shabbos. So getting back to Mordechai. What does Mordechai want? Absolutely no avoid the Zorah. Nothing that's outside the realm of Alikus. Lo yichrav, lo yishtach, but anything in the world. Even something that may be permissible according to Shulchan Aruch. But if it's not avoid the Hashem, he says, this is avoid the Zorah. This is something foreign. This is outside of my avoid. On the other hand, what is the Ratzin of Haman? Haman wants avoid the Zorah. And Avodah Zorah, not necessarily in the literal sense, Rahman al but as we said before, any Avodah that's foreign for the Yid, since it's not Avodah Hashem. And what's Haman's argument? Since we find ourselves in the Gashmi, is the world, in a physical world. And in Golos, we are bent to the laws and limitations of nature that the Abishta created, so we have to take them into consideration, at least regarding our mundane life, all of our mundane things and matters of the world. So basically what comes out at last says Kirtsoin Ishva Ish. To be able to fulfill the desires both of, both of Mordechai and Haman is really a contradiction with, in, in terms. Because a Yid is, is in this Gashmi is the world. In Zmanagol, it says, we said, Akati Avdi Achashmerish Anan, servants of Achashmerish. With his various different limitations, both because of the laws of nature, the world, and the country. We know Dina the Malchus Dina, we have to listen to the laws of the government when it's not in contradiction to the fulfillment of Torah and Mitzvahs, which seem to be all forcing the Yid to act in a certain way. This seems to be even what the Abish the ones and according to Torah. So in that case, it seems to be you cannot have Kertzoin Ishva Ish to be able to fulfill the desire both of Mordechai and Haman. Why not? Mordechai is with the attitude lo yichrav, lo saying that anything that's outside of Avoidus Hashem is Avoidus Zara. That seems to be negating not only to act in Haman's style, but his whole, whole approach to life. They, need, they seem to be needing to take into consideration what the world says, have the laws of the world, the laws of nature, and the country. On the other hand, if we are taking into consideration the fact that the Abish just sent Yidin into Golos, so then it would seem to be you have to act, as we call it, Kurtzoy and You have to somehow take the laws of nature and the world into consideration if it's not a contradiction to Torah and Mitzvahs. So basically, are we taking the world into consideration or not? And yet, here is the Chiddush that the Rebbe comes up with, that when we are connected with the Abish there, the Abish to be completely, completely higher than the conduct of the world, we can actually combine these two opposites. That we can be in the world, in the time of Golos, and yet lo yichra lo we could find ourselves completely above and beyond all of this. And the Rebbe says, now we can understand what the Medrash is saying. The two different attitudes of a Yid in his avoid in the time of Golos. This is in Sif test we just started. Since the Abish just sent the Yid into Eilum Hazar, and within that itself into Golos, under an Achashmerish, and it's a din in the Torah that Dina de Malchus, a dina, we need to listen to the laws of the government. So you may think, as, the, as Haman says, that in matters of the world, if it's not connected to Torah and Mitzvahs, so it's not possible to have these ideas of Ritzoyin, Ish, Ish, Mordechai, and Haman at the same time, meaning that at the same time that we are in Golos, servants of Achashverosh, we should still have an attitude of completely not being affected by anything of the world. Because you would think, either way, 
if the Abish to send you to Golos, that means in some way we are limited by nature and by the laws of the country. Kurtzoyin Hama. If we're not in Golos, meaning to say we are acting Kurtzoyin Mordechai in a way of lo yichra, lo yishtachave. We're completely not in a spot, not looking at the world at all. Well, then you don't have Ritzayin Hama. So you don't have these two things really coming together. It's really, really either or. And the Rebbe explains. Regarding the obligations that a Yid has to do in Torah and Mitzvah according to Shulchan Aruch, that's obvious that nobody could have any sort of authority over the Yid, even, regard, even in the time of Golos. That's obvious. But we're speaking over here about matters of Rishus, matters of the world, Masecha and Rochecha, our mundane activities. So here the question is, how is it possible to have both the Ratzin of Haman, meaning to say that we're taking the world and nature of the world into consideration, and if not, it's over mitzvah samelech, you seem to be going against what the king ordered, and at the same time also having what Mordechai says, lo yichra lo yishtachar. Says the Rebbe, this is what the Medish tells us. This is all true. When is there some sort of contradiction? Benoyhek sheboilam, that's when we're dealing with the normal order of the world. But mitzah the the way the Abish is completely higher than nature, we could actually have both opposites together. That is, that on the one hand, the Yid is in the world and in Golos, of the Yachashverish, and at the same time, he's completely, completely above and beyond all matters of the world in Golos, and that's why he's lo yichra lo And in fact, he even has an impact on the Goyesha king, who seemingly is ruling over him, the Yid could have even an impact over him. And the Rebbe says, this is what the Gemara meant, when it said, La sister, so in ish ish to be able to fulfill the Ratzin of both Mordechai and Haman. In the Medrash we said, seems to be like, it doesn't really work so well. Only by the Eibishter works, of course. But the Gemara seems to be saying that by Hashverish this is the case. Because the Pshat is, that by Mordechai standing with a complete bitul to the Eibishter, lo yichra lo yishtachva, completely not affected by anything, completely denouncing and denying Avay de Zorah, this is connecting him with the strength of the Abishta, which is higher than the world, giving him the koyach, that even as he is in Golos Poros, under the authority of King Ahasuerus, he should be able to stand in the greatest way of lo yichra lo yishtachave, and ultimately even achieving the nullification of the Gzeira of Haman, and eventually Mordechai becoming Mishnah Lamelech himself. And the Abishta gives this over to the desire and to the decision of every single Yid. Even as the Yid is in Golos, he has the choice also to act so in Ish Ish. What does that mean? He has the uh, ability to choose, to stand strong only according to that which is necessary in the fulfillment of Torah and Mitzvahs Bepoil. But in all other things, he considers himself and thinks of himself as limited by nature and the conduct of the world and so on. And that is Kurtzoyin Homon, which we said is Avoida Shazoroloi. This is an Avoida that there's still some things that are sort of outside the domain of Kedusha. Or he acts in a way of Ritzoyin Mordechai, that in every single aspect he acts completely higher than the world, higher than Golos, because he's connected to the Abishta, and therefore Lo Yichra, the Lo Yishtach, he doesn't bend to anything that's not Avoida Hashem. And it's only dependent on the Yid's own Ratzoyin. To decide which way he wants to go. Nevertheless, as the Rebbe adds in the end of the bra- in the brackets at the end of Seif Tess, there is a difference over the generations. That in other generations there was still some sort of limitations from the outside. There were certain Xeris Hamalchos, government um, decrees, and so on, which didn't enable the Yid so much to be able to stand higher than the goal is completely. Where, where as in our generation, the Rebbe says it's really only dependent on your own rotsin, as we'll explain soon. If you'd. Says the Rebbe, now we can understand also the special mile, the special quality of Yehuda, Vayigashel of Yehuda, even more than Yosef. Even though it's true that Yosef, at Tzadik, was ruling the whole land, which represents already the idea that a Yid is Balabos, a Yid has power, rulership over the world and over the Goyim around him, and so on. However, first of all, he was set up over there by Pari Melech Mitzrayim. That means that itself is part of the laws of the country and the king. 
Second of all, even as after he's appointed, there's Rakakise Egdal Mimeka Pari is still higher than him, which shows that Yosef, in some subtle way, is still connected with the limitations of the world and of Mitzrayim. Whereas by Yigashel of Yehuda is expressed by the fact that he comes over to Yosef without asking permission, as we said before, and he affects that Velo Yochel Yosef Leisapi. He he affects Yosef. He impacts Yosef. That eventually Yosef cannot contain himself, and so on and so forth. Which all shows that Yehuda is with the attitude that he completely doesn't take into consideration anything of the conduct of the country and the meaning of the world and so on. In other words, you have over here, in a sense, combining two opposite, or it's like we said before, Kertzoyn Ishvish. On the one hand, Yehuda knows that he needs to come on to Yosef in order to free Binyam. Yehuda says to Yosef, realizing that he has the power similar to Pari to fulfill Yehuda's requests. Also, by the way, the Rebbe says, with that he was making sure that Yosef doesn't start sending him away um, to Pari with the argument that, oh, um, Pari is above me and so on. But Yehuda is telling Yosef, you're just like Pari to me. So that's all on the one hand. And at the same time, on the other hand, he is acting in, with such, in such a bold way, in such a courageous way, as if he doesn't need Yosef at all, by Yigash of Yehuda coming over to Yehuda with the greatest strength and courage. And therefore, it's specifically after Yehuda's attitude, by Yigash of Yehuda, he didn't get the Koyach, with the help of Yosef, of course, that by Yeshev Beretz Mitzrayim, Yisrael Beretz Mitzrayim, that he didn't live in the land of Mitzrayim, in the land of Goshen, in the best part of the land, even though they're in Mitzrayim, which is Mitzorim Mugvulim limitations. They're under Paroi. And yet, Vayeshev Yisrael, they're sitting there in a proper way, in a real way. Vayeshev taking hold of the land, they get a achuzah, a real piece of the land, and holding on to it, which means to say that they're becoming the Balabas over the place, taking, making, taking authority over the place. And Vayifru, Vayir Buboid, being fruitful and multiplying over there in a way, Lamailam and Didavahag Bolo. And that in turn leads to Vayechi Yaakov, Beretz Mitzrayim, Shvayas Nishono, that we know that Yaakov lives his best years, 17, Begumatri Yatoiv, his best years, Beruchnis and Begashmis in Mitzrayim. Just very, very briefly to summarize some of the main points that we're just learning, is that what the Rebbe is explaining is that Yehuda's special mile, similar to Mordechai, is this idea of being completely, completely beyond the limitations, restrictions, and attitudes of Golos, in other words, even though on the one hand being in a state of Golos, and at the same time being completely, completely beyond it, and the Rebbe is saying that each and every Yid also has the Koyach to act in a similar way. Says the Rebbe in Sefi Dalif. Now we can also understand the connection of Ayiga Sheil of Yehuda in the beginning of the parsha, with the David Avdi Nasi Lehem Lo'ilom in the Haftoyinah, which we asked before that seemed to be two opposites. Originally it seemed that Ayiga Sheil of Yehuda is really saying that Yosef is greater and the Haftoyinah it comes out that Yehuda will be greater. So the Rebbe says, the strength of Yehuda approaching Yosef, which really comes because of Yehuda's connection with the Eibishter. Yehuda's from the word Lashon Hoido, thanking and submitting oneself to the Eibishter. Yehuda is connected to the Eibishter in a way that's completely higher than the conduct of the world, the way it's going to be lost in Lavoy. That itself is the Hachana. Yehuda's way of conduct is the Hachana. Is what gives the koyach to the bringing the gula amitis vashleima. When it'll be nizgalah betachlis ashleimus in the whole world, the strength of the David Avdi nasi lohem loelam, which is connected to the power and strength of the Abishter, which is the one that we said before could do the ritzoyn yirei of yasek. It combined to opposites, and in such a way that he even impacts the goyim, as it says in the haftoyin of yedu hagoyim ki ani Hashem, that the goyim will know I am Hashem. And as the Rambam Paskins, the Yilchay Mulchem is Hashem, the Mashiach is going to fight the wars of Hashem and be victorious over all the nations around him and be piled that all the nations will turn to the Abishter and will call out to the Abishter and serve the Abishter in a united way. And as it's explained in many places, that the Koyach for the Gili of the David Avdi Nasi Lohem Loilum, which we just said is the Milo of Yehuda, really is coming from Vayiga Shail of Yehuda, from the fact that Yehuda approached Yosef. Chassidus explains that by Yehuda approaching Yosef, he was getting a hashpa from Yosef. And that itself helps to reveal the Milo of Yehuda, that the David Avdi, Nasi Lohem Loilo. 
To explain the chassidus, this is similar to the idea of smichas geula letfila. That we're supposed to say gal yisrael right next to shmoy nesrei, as we'll see in a minute. That shmoy nesrei is more connected to Yehuda. The idea of geula is connected to Yosef. So, what happens when smichas gula letfila when we bring gal yisrael the bracha of gula right next to tefila? That we're poyel. That also within the tefila, within the level of malchus or the level of Yehuda. Into that is nimshach vigula. When you bring them together, that means the geula itself is nimshach coming in into the level of shmoyne esrei. Again, being the level of malchus is nimshach the level of geula, which is the level of Yosef, or the level of yisoid. And it becomes what's called the geula arichta. The Gemara discusses sometimes these things that we seem to be making an interruption between the geula and tefillah, but the Gemara calls it. It's one long geula. It's really part of the brach of geula as well. So in other words, that Malchus itself becomes and has the mile of Gula, or as the expression, Hamalach HaGoyel. Based on this, as the Rebbe, we could add and say that the idea of Ayigash Eil of Yehuda emphasizes, in addition to just the fact that Yehuda is approaching and getting from Yosef, as based on everything we said before in the Sikha, it's also emphasizing the strength of Yehuda. Taka, because of his mile over Yosef. Because as we said, it is a coming out a certain advantage in Yehuda, even over Yosef. And the fact that he needs to come on to Yehuda and request things from Yehuda is only in order to ultimately reveal his own strength, Mishlemus, as it will be, Lo'asid Lovey. Says the Rebbe in Seyfid Beis, based on all of this, we can understand now the Hayra from Ayiga Sheil of Yehuda regarding our generation, regarding our Tkufa, standing so close just before the Geula Amitiz Vashlema. Notwithstanding all the strength of Yehuda in his time and Mordechai in his time and the Tzaddikim and Yidin in all generations, still in all previous generations there were so- certain limitations from the outside because of the Goyim, because of their Gzairis on the Yidin, Rachman Litzlan and Hoyo which not always allowed, enabled the Yidin to act with the full strength of Balabatishkeit. Whereas in our generation and in our time, we see clearly that we don't have all of these disturbances as in the past, and the Goyim are allowing Yidin to act as they wish, and therefore now it's surely only dependent on the Ratzin of the Yid, that it should be to be able to act in the greatest way, and as it's being Mekuyim B'poyil in many places with the whole strength, with a whole great kite, with all of the, with all of the courage and boldness and 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 power that a yid could could uh, could do, and this applies both in this country in America, in the United States, which is a malchus shol chesed, which allows yidden to do as they decided in their own ratzon, and so too in many other countries in the world. And in recent years, we see that even in those countries, which previously there were certain limitations then now those Hagbolis were also nullified, as we discussed many times, and Adarab, not only Yidin are free to act according to their desires, but furthermore the Goyesha governments themselves are actually helping them. In addition to the fact that Yidin are able to act in the way of Torah and Mitzvahs in their own Daladamas, in their private little place, we see Bepoyal that in recent years it became easier and easier also to be Poyal in every single place that the Yidin come, they could sort of take charge in all parts of the world, because now the world itself, not only Yidin, but even the Goyim, are a keli to be macabre matters of Yiddishkeit, Torah, and Mitzvahs, and regarding the Goyim, of course, Sheva Mitzvahs B'nai Noyach. Furthermore, the Rebbe, the Rebbe says, as we spoke many, many times recently, that according to the Oido, according to the notification of Kvoit Kedusha Smoyri V'chami Admur Nesid that by now we finished already all the Achonis for the Gulu, and now we just need to be mamshir the gula b'poyel begashmius into the physicality and the materialism of the world, Mater- materialism that turns into gashmius. So drawing down the gula into this gashmius, the world begali leini basar, because notwithstanding all the strength of Yidden in the time of Golos, even as they are standing in a state of a ruchni is the gula, but still it doesn't come to the shleimus as it's going to be by the gula b'pashtus. We're going to have it in a revealed way in this gashmius the world. So nevertheless, we have, bottom line is, we still have the situation of Golas, of like children being exiled from their father's table, including the fact that Yidin are counted, considered like an Aguna Rachman, like someone that her husband went overseas 
after the first stage of marriage, referring to the Abishter, of course, being married to the Yidin by Yitzhiyas Mitzrayim, and then there will be the final Nisuin, the final marriage by the Gula Amitiz Vashleim, but in the meantime, it's as if the husband has gone overseas. So by now, the Rebbe says, we're holding in a situation already so close to the Gula, the Rebbe says, all we need to do now is open our eyes and see how the whole world is demanding that every single Yid should be already in a state of Gula Amitiz Vashleim. Vashleimar. The Rebbe says we could say that this itself is the reason for the fact that we see today how Yidin are able to stand in all matters of Yiddishkeit with a full strength and Balabatishkeit even over Goyim. And it's only dependent on the Ratzon of the Yid. And why is that? Now, specifically, because we're standing so close to the Gul of the time when it's going to be revealed with David Avdi, Nasi Lahem Lo'ilam, and that the Goyim will know that I am Hashem. Therefore, this is reflectory also in the situation in our generation as a direct hachana for the gula mitis vashleima al yidei mashiach tzedkenu. The Rebbe says we can add that this is also hinted in the words vayigash el of Yehuda that together with all of the help and the strength of the avoid of the yosef of our generation, which is kavod kedusha smoyri v'chami admur nesidereinu. So yosef being a hint over here to the free the Rebbe. So in addition to that, we also have the Vayigash Eil of Yehuda, that is Mashiach, that will come B'Karo of Mamish, the David Avdi Nasi Lahem Lo'olam, which comes B'Siyua, which comes by the help and the special Nasinas Koyach, from Yosef of our generation, Kamoicha Kifaro, we said Yosef is like Pari, but here we're speaking about in a positive sense, Pari of Kedusha, the level of the Abishta, which is called Pari, from which Pari means is revealed, all of the greatest oiris. If I may just add, al it seems to, from here, if we could say so, it seems almost obvious in this paragraph that the Yosef, as the Rebbe is pointing out, is referring to the Friedrich Rebbe, and then the Rebbe is saying, Vayigash Eil of Yehuda, which is coming by Koyach of Yosef, is referring to Moshiach, that seems to be a clear remiss to the Rebbe himself. Back to the Sikh. From all of this, we understand the lesson to our generation. And when we act in a way of Ayyiga Shail of Yehuda, in all matters of Yiddishkeit, we stand with the greatest strength. And Balabatishkeit, being a Yid, that we recognize that Bishwil Yisrael and Nivroil of the whole world was created for the sake of the Yid. That itself brings to the David Abdi Nasi Lohem Loilom for Mashiach to be the leader of Yidin forever and ever. Says the Rebbe in Sif Yudimu. The idea of Ayyiga Shail of Yehuda, this special strength of Yidin in the Time in, in over the world in our generation, especially emphasized in, on the day of Hay Tevis, which that year was on Thursday, just before Shabbos, and that the Shabbos that the Rebbe is saying the Sikh is Zion Tevis is within three ta- days of Hay Tevis. What's Hay Tevis? It's a day that's specially connected with the release and the Pidyo and Shvuyim of the Sforim and Ksavim of the writings in the Sforim of Rabbi Seinu Nisiyen of our Rabbeim, in a way that the came with a full agreement and help from the government and Goyish courts, in the eyes of all the nations, in the federal court. However, says the Rebbe, there are still Sfarim and Kisveyad of the free Rebbe and his father, the Rebbe Rashab, which are still in captivity back in Russia and still not returned to their place. Even though, even regarding them, there was already orders from the government, also the Goyish government, that they should be released. And... It is, they connect with the fact that in recent days the capital city of that country was in this battle and moved to another a city based on the laws and, uh, of that particular country, which in that case we say Dino de Balchus of Dino. So the Rebbe says, what is it that we could do Bapoyal to somehow hasten the pidyo in the return of these Sforim and these manuscripts? And the Rebbe says the answer is very simple. It's by every single Yid men, women, and children, we should do something similar to this idea by bringing into our houses, into our libraries, etc. Holy Sfarim and Ksavim, new Inyanim of Torah, in addition to all of the Sfarim that we had before, by Yismol Sfarim. And the Rebbe says, today this is very, very easy to perform, because every single week there's new matters of Torah being printed, both as far as things that are reprinted, and more importantly, new things, so therefore, it's so easy to buy Sfarim, and in that way, um, to add more and more in receiving and buying Sfarim. The Rebbe says it's known the explanation of Nesi Deireinu, 
regarding the fact that it, for, they have to pay for a safer. And the Rebbe says that the Friedrich Rebbe sometimes actually instructed to print the price of the safer on some of the countries. And the reason he explained was because in this world, oil is Lord hell of the Hester. The way it works is in this world is that something important costs money. In other words, when you pay for something, it's, it's more valuable. And actually, it's, a, it's based on a Maimar Chazal. The Gemara says, Asya the Mogin be Mogin Mogin Shom. That a doctor that heals for free, well, that's what he's worth. He's not worth anything either, or the cure isn't worth anything. So, especially regarding matters of Torah, which Torah brings it forward to the world, of course we have to pay for it. Says Rebbe Vachala, Zori Zariz and Meshubo, the quicker we ask, act in this way, the more praiseworthy it is to be Makabal Achlotus Toivis regarding this now. And to fulfill it as soon as possible, including ordering Sfarim in advance and paying for it by making an order to receive new Sfarim that are going to come out, um, similar to a book club type of thing that you're going to get every new Sefer that comes out, that as soon as um, the Sefer comes out, those that have subscribed immediately get the Sefer. In addition to this, the Rebbe says it's Kedai, it's, it's appropriate to utilize the Minig Yisrael, to give holy svarim that are printed as a matana to others, including to little children, for their simcha, or before a yomtif, etc. The Rebbe concludes in Sif Yudal by every single yid broadening his pu'ulais in, getting new svarim. This will hasten even more the, the fulfillment of Ayigash Eil of Yehuda, that there should be the pigeon shvuyim. Like in that case, it was a pigeon shvuyim of Binyamin. But in this case, the pigeon shuim of all of the Sfarim and Ksavim of Rabbi Seinu Nisienu to come back to their real place, to base Rabbeinu Shabbat to 770, which is the gematria of the word Paratsta. There they will join all the Sfarim and all of the Ksavim of Rabbi Seinu Nisienu. And the take it from the Yad Mamish, this will bring the pigeon shuim of all sparks of holiness in the world. And the take it from the Yad Mamish, Mamish, all the Yidin will go with our young and old, with our sons and our daughters, together with our silver and gold. Together with all their sforim and all their ksovim, la arzeinu agdoish to our holy land, Yerushalayim and Hakodesh, la har Hakodesh, la beis hamidrash ashlishi, and to the Kodesh Hakadoshim, with the even hashasiyah standing, without any change whatsoever from the time of the creation of the world, and all of this taken from Yad Mamsh.